Lord, amen. amen. Really good to be here. Nice to see all of you. And I pray that you have come to hear the word. I pray that you have come to sense the presence of Christ. And uh, my prayer is a simple prayer to this morning, that if anything comes out of this flesh, out of me, that you don't even receive it. I need to be transparent, and you need to hear the voice of Almighty God. Amen? Amen. That's what we are here to receive, the voice of Christ. So with all that said, there is our title, called to be an ambassador. Now that may not mean a whole lot to a lot of people. Maybe it doesn't even make sense to some of you that are newly saved. But I want you to understand that the moment you got saved, the very moment you accepted Christ, whether it be that you accepted Christ at an altar at another church or here, or whether you accepted Christ in your privacy of your life at home, or maybe at the workplace you bowed your head because you were overwhelmed by the problems that were overcoming you, you had enough, you bowed, you surrendered. Once you accepted Christ, I want you to know that that was going to be your last comfortable day. How many of you know that? A lot of people think, well, you know what, I'm saved, and now I can live like hell, and I can do whatever I want to do, and I can be laid back, and I can be lethargic and apathetic, and I can be just absolutely lazy about my life because I know that I am going to heaven. Well, the latter part of that is true, but the frontal part of that is wrong. I want you to realize that once you get saved, then God calls you into his kingdom, and he is the one, and only he is the one, that brought salvation to you. A lot of people say, well, I found Christ. He was not lost, you were. And he didn't have to look hard to find you because he knew exactly where you were, and he knew the exact moment of when he was going to save you, and also you're going to find he knew the exact moment of when he was going to create you. Amen? Amen. So you come to find that at the moment of your new creation, that from that point on, you have been freely given, and God is saying in his word, now I want you to be my ambassador. I want you to carry out the reality of what you know is truth that has brought salvation to you. And now from this day forward, with every breath you have, I want you to go and I want you to bring salvation to others. And you'll never have to worry about how am I going to do it? What am I going to say? You will find as we get into it that there's nothing to do with what you're going to do. You are just called to open up your mouth. Can you say amen? amen. It kind of reminds me of the story of Jonah. I'm not going to be preaching about Jonah. That's an underwater thing, and we're not going to talk about it for the moment. But Jonah, Jonah, you come to find that God went to Jonah, and he said, Listen, I have these people that I created, the Ninevites. They are putrid. They are downright evil. And I want you, Jonah, to go, and I want you to give them a message on repentance. Let them know, if they don't repent, that I am going to come, and I'm going to wipe them out. Now, Jonah might have taken God a little wrong at what God was asking. He might have thought just that. Well, God is asking me. First of all, he would have thought, you know what? I'm not going there. I hate those people as much as you probably do, Lord. Because you have to understand, the Ninevites were arch enemies to the Israelites, right? And he might have thought, well, God is asking me, would you like to go? And so Jonah had to back up a few steps and say, mm, nah, I'm not going and God wasn't asking him, God was telling him, this is your assignment, this is what I've called you to do. I want you to know, Jonah, I've created you for a time such as this. You are my voice, and only you are my voice to go and speak the word of repentance to this vol uh, volatile uh, 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 people, that if they don't hear the message of surrendering to me, they're going to be annihilated. Now, you find that Jonah even then said, no, I'm not going, and God said, we're going to do this the easy way, or we're going to do it the hard way. So you come to find that over a long period of time, Jonah finally said, oh, I catch on now. You were actually telling me, you weren't asking me, were you, Lord? Well, uh, please recognize there's a second fold to this whole, this whole story. The whole story was, God knew, the Bible says God knows the end from the beginning. He knew before time began that there was going to be a culture called the Ninevites. He knew that they were going to be uh, reprobate, that they were going to be vile toward him. And so God knew the exact time that he was going to create 
his voice on earth. He knew the exact time he was going to create that of Jonah. Jonah was created at the exact moment, the exact time. And God had given Jonah his utterance. The utterance of God is the anointed word of God. Amen? Jonah didn't have to worry. What am I going to say when I get there? How am I going to say it? How am I going to present it? Remember what Jesus said? When you open up your mouth, I will be able to speak through you. So recognize something. A lot of people, as far as you go, a lot of people ask the question, well, why am I here and I'm here in the year 2023? Why am I not, why wasn't I not born in 1600s, 1700s, 1800s? Why am I here now? Because God has equipped you and created you at this exact time because you, as like Jonah, are the person God needs in the arena where God has now placed you in your life to be his voice to a certain few people wherever you travel. That is your ministry. Amen? Amen. And he's expecting, he has saved you, he's expecting now for you to open up your big trap and start telling other people about the saving grace, the saving knowledge of Jesus yeah. Christ. So every one of us, every one of us have a ministry. Yes. And also, every one of us have a mission. Yes. And let me unfold that to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 8, chapter 5, I'm sorry, starting with verse 18, Paul says to the Corinthian church, all thing, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And here it is. And God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God has turned over. All authority has been given to us. That we now are the ones that have not only the, uh, the ministry, but also a great mission. Yes. That the ministry God has given to us is to go out and Amen. preach the word of reconciliation. Amen. Every one of you in this assembly, by the hearing of my voice, God Amen. has called you yes. to the ministry of reconciling yes. others into the kingdom of God. Amen. In other words, you have been given the knowledge yes. of Jesus Christ having come and died for your salvation and the salvation of all mankind. So in other words, it's not just up to the pastor. It's not just up to the evangelist, the teacher, the missionary. Every one of you yes. have the knowledgeable truth that has been resonant in your heart. He wants you to open up your mouth and he wants you to speak that others that are around you will be saved. In other words, you have been called by God to be his ambassador. You are to go out and you are to speak to others who may not understand about God, who may not have any insight about God, and you are the ones that have been called to be the representatives of Christ from heaven to earth, that God wants you now to be his voice. That's why Timothy says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because ultimately, ultimately, God's fullest intention is basically He's looking for every man, every woman, every child, every adult that will have the privilege to come and receive the blessing of everlasting life. And God has committed unto you and I the ministry, the commitment of the ministry of reconciliation. You're not going to find that Jesus Christ is going to come down from heaven and go face to face with people any longer. He has given that ministry to us. Yes. And he's saying to us, you are going to be my ambassadors. You are going to be my representatives on earth. You're going to be my heart. You're going to be my hands. You're going to be my, my compassion. You're going to be my love that I want to extend to those who don't know me. And so we are, as Paul says, we are now, as you have been saved, you now, your life has now just begun in a whole new direction. Amen. You are going to be his ambassadors. Amen? Yes. And we are to carry out the mission of what God has intended Hallelujah. for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it said, now, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading 
through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Let me give it to you better like this. The moment you got saved, the moment you accepted Christ, you became like a hot air balloon. Anybody remember these times? When you first got saved and you went back to your first love with Christ, all of a sudden, there was such a joy, such a jubilation, such an excitement. You felt like, oh my God, I've never sensed this before. You sensed the presence of God. You heard the voice of God for the first time. It seemed like all of your problems, commotions, issues, addictions, they just came and they melted away from you. Things were so elated in your life. And you were like, as I say, a hot air balloon. And, and you, were, you were just uh, not like the rest of the crowd. Because the rest of the audience in the church who had been serving the Lord for a while, they had become dignified. Yeah. Dignification with God is putrefication, okay? He can't use somebody who's so dignified because they're not pliable anymore. And if they try to go and they try to win the lost, they try to win the lost like this. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Who wants to hear that? Amen? Yeah. Who wants to hear that? You might, as well go to a cem you might as well go to a cemetery and go see where uh, Crystal works, and you might, might want to go to a funeral home, and you want to speak to the dead, because that's, that's about as good as it's going to get how uh, attractive you're going to be to people. But God wants you to hold on to a certain amount of your excitement, certain amount of your joy, certain amount of your, uh, your, your zeal, if you will. That you can go and you can tell the people that are hurting and broken and dark in a dark place that there is life and there is joy and there's comfort and there's peace in serving the Lord. Yeah. But if you find that you become dignified and you don't even want to open your mouth, then you're going to find that you're not fulfilling your ambassadorship. And because of the fact that now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you're not living up to your new nature. Amen? Not living up to your new nature. But I want to give you this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And I want you to really write this down. I want you to follow the bullet, point, bullet points of what I'm about to give you regarding this scripture. Because many of you probably have never seen these things before. And this is going to pinpoint to you. You are not here as a perhaps. You were not born in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. It's not a mistake that you are here at this period of time. For here you find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we come to find that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, and he's writing to you as well. For we are his workmanship. We, we, we. What's that referring to? All of us. Nobody's excluded, excluded from it, right? All of us. We are his workmanship. And we, collectively, have been created in Christ Jesus, yes. not for bad works, not for bad putrid thoughts and bad works, but for good works, yes. which that? God prepared beforehand yes. that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. And I'll explain more of that as we get into it regarding your personal life. But I want you to understand something. The word workmanship, and I've told you this many a time before, the word workmanship is the Greek word poeme. It's where we get the English word poeme. Poetry. Come on, guys. Poetry. Poem. 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 In other words, before God ever put you in your mother's womb, the God who knows the end from the beginning wrote out a beautiful poem that would depict every facet of your life. Every facet of your life. He put in there every stanza, every comma, every, he crossed every T, dotted every I, put every high, every low, every sadness, every gladness, every, everything that you are going to go through. He wrote out a beautiful poem regarding your life. Once you took your first breath on earth, then that poem began to become unfolded yes. in history. People started to see then, and people see now the reality of yes. God's poem regarding your life because it's now being unfolded, if you will. Amen? Not only is the word workmanship meaning a poem, but it also means, it means a masterpiece. And a masterpiece is not two alike. There's only one, one masterpiece. So as you remember, you are a masterpiece with Christ. 
because of the fact that you have a specific DNA, a unique DNA, you have unique fingerprints, you have a unique face about you, nobody else is going to look like you. For some I say thank God. And otherwise, and otherwise, you also have a unique assignment in your life. So you are a masterpiece with God. Now I want to break away for a moment, and I don't want you to think, well, I'm a born-again believer, so therefore now I'm a masterpiece. No. Every human being ever created on planet Earth is a masterpiece for Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen? God had created all people with unique DNA, unique fingerprints, yes. unique features, unique purpose. Every one of them. Now the difference is, if they don't know Christ, then they are a masterpiece without, without power. There's no influence. There's no attraction. They have no understanding of the of the creator of all heaven and earth. Therefore, they're not going around with the influence and the utterance of God is assembled inside of them to be able to share that truth with others. But once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you become a masterpiece of influence. The power source is turned on inside of you. God places His anointed word inside of you and once it's inside of you, now you are out there and you are to share the Word of God with others. But I want you to know that if you don't see yourself as a, as a masterpiece, then you can't, you can't know that you are a masterpiece. And if you can't know that you are a masterpiece, you are not going to think like a masterpiece. And if you can't think like a masterpiece, you are never going to act like a masterpiece. And because of that, you are never going to shine the reality of what God intended for your life. You have no ambassadorship about you. Other people around you are going to die and go to hell because you have chose not to open up your mouth. Not to open up your mouth. Why is that so important? Because of what Matthew chapter 10 verse 33 says. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. So here you are. You're saved. Born again believer. And you're constantly asking, begging, and pleading for help. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I need this. I need that. I need this miracle. I need that miracle. You're asking and you're pleading constantly. But yet, not even in one time a year, do you ever share and open up your mouth and share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the ambassador that God has called you to, with others. In other words, you are kind of ashamed to let other people around where you are, where you're living, in the workplace, wherever, you're ashamed of Christ. And you behave like Peter and say, I don't even know that man. I don't even know him. And Peter was a dear friend to him at the time. Amen? So you come to church, you plead with God, you're praying for help, you're praying for a miracle, and you're, you're petitioning God, and you're hoping that God is going to come through, then come Monday, you're right back into the workplace, behaving the same old way, you shut your mouth, you're not doing anything, and again, you're saying, I don't even know that man. Well, you don't necessarily say that, of course, but by the fact that you don't open up your mouth and let it be expressed, I'm a born-again believer, Jesus Christ has saved me, and you can share your testimony with others, but you don't do that, and when you don't do that, you are finding out that you're not doing and fulfilling what God had intended. But remember what Jesus said. And hold on to it dearly. He said, if you deny me before men on earth, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. So here you are, you're crying out for God to help you. You're crying out for God to bless you. But listen to what he says. God the Father wants to help you. God the Father wants to give you what it is you're asking for. But God the Father changed the mandate of authority in heaven once Jesus Christ rose from the dead and walked on the earth and then ascended into heaven. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. God the Father took His Son and said, Well done, and put Him in the executive, executive chair. Jesus Christ is now in charge. Anything that the Father wants to provide you that you are petitioning heaven for, the Father has to go through the Son, and Jesus has to sign off on it. He has to sign off on it. So if the Father turns around and you have cried out to the Father, 
I need this, I need that, whatever. And the father says to Jesus, what do you think, son? <laughs> You're in trouble. Because Jesus may turn around and say, well, well, father, I want you to know that they go to church quite often. Not all the time, as I would hope. But they, don't, they go to church quite often. And after church, they usually go to one or two restaurants, wherever they go. And I want you to know that not a one time have they ever opened up their mouth and let the waiter or the waitress know of my unbelievable love, that I want to save them, I want to heal them, I want to provide for them. Not a once did they ever do it. They live in a certain location because that's where we have planted them. They live in a, they live in a neighborhood, and they live in a society, and they have neighbors all around them. And they have neighbors that are broken, neighbors that are hurting, neighbors that are in, in the midst of a divorce and drugs and alcohol, wayward children and all kind of havoc. But my people don't want to get involved. They don't want to get their nose involved in somebody else's business. So therefore, they never ever get out of the house. They never go to somebody else and share the gospel truth with them. And they, they deny me. And you know, I put them on a job for 20 or 25 years. Not once did they ever go to a co-worker and let the co-worker who had been destitute, broken, hurting financially, emotionally, or even maritally, where they were in a suicidal case, that never once did they go and open up their mouth and let them know about me. So Father, I say that we need to hold back on the breakthrough that you're willing to give them. Because if we give them the breakthrough they're asking for, they're just going to receive more and more from us, and they're going to forget about us all the more. Amen? Remember what Jesus said, if you, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. And he's calling you and I not to be that person. He wants us to be his ambassadors. The ambassador, the actual word means one who absolutely makes an appeal to the world. You make an appeal to the world around you. Amen? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You are to be able and ready to respond when you are witnessing to somebody as to what it is. You have to answer every question that they may come back at you with. You, may, you have to be ready. If they turn around and say, well, how do, how do I know that my sins are forgiven? How do, you, how do I know for sure that I'm actually going to go to heaven? You have to be ready to respond to the great hope that is in you. Don't turn around and give them a card and say, here's the number to our church. Call the church and ask for the pastor. He can explain it better than I. No, no, no. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Paul said. Paul said through, or Peter said, he said, you are to give a reason for the hope that is in you. That's what Peter said. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says this, but you are a chosen generation. You have been hand selected. Amen. That's upper class. You are upper class. Yes. Not equal to the world. Amen. You are a royal priesthood. Yes. That is that masterpiece thing. You are of a heavenly kingdom. Yes. You are sons and daughters of the most high God. You are not a citizen any longer to the things of this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. And God allowed you to come to earth to become his ambassador on earth. Amen? Can you say amen? amen? And it goes on and says, You are a holy nation. You are separated, distinct. You are God's own hand-selected special people. So why did God save us? Lord, why did you save me? Why did you save all of these people here so far? At the end of verse 9 it says, That you may proclaim that you may proclaim, that you may open up your mouth, is what that means, so that you may proclaim the praises of Him who are called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Amen. Hallelujah. God has called you and He's created you. Amen. He's created you for a time such yes. as this. You are not here as a mistake, as I repeat. God knew exactly what he needed on earth. So he didn't turn around and say, 
Okay, I'm going to create. I'm going to create Nancy Carver. He creates Nancy Carver, and then he scratches his head and says, "What are we going to do with her now?" <laughs> See, it doesn't work that way. God already knew what the need was, so He brought a Nancy Carver into the world. Yes. He also knew the people that she would go speak to, so he brought her into the world at the exact precise time that she needed to be here, just like Jonah, okay? Yes. He has brought you into the world for the exact purpose and exact timeline of the people where you would have what's called uh, 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 the region or the jurisdictional authority over the region of your life. When he wrote the poem about your life, he knew exactly where he was going to place you. You, wherever you live, wherever you went to school, the neighborhood that you exist in, the workplace that you go to, that is the jurisdictional authority that God has given to you, whereas you are to go and you are to celebrate the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with those unbelievers around you. That's what God is asking you to do. But if you turn around and deny to do that because you deny him and therefore you're ashamed of him, you don't want to help people in that area, as like Jonah, he didn't say, okay, Jonah, you don't want to go? I'll go get uh, Hezekiah or, or Bona or Donah or something. No, he said, no, Jonah, I created you for a time such as this. Amen. He's saying to you as well, you don't want to open your mouth? Nobody else is going to do it for you. I put you in that arena. I put you in that neighborhood. I put you in that workplace. I put you in that school. I put you in that household. I put you where I wanted you to be to open up your mouth and exhibit the truth of the gospel to those people around you. And because if you don't open your mouth and you don't bring forth the truth of the gospel, then there's no witnessing. And if there's no witness, then there's no authority of a word. And if the word's not there, of a witnessing word, then there's, there's no faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And if so, therefore they don't have any faith, how can they respond? How can they know that they are to accept Jesus Christ and bow before him and, and ask for forgiveness of their sins? And therefore, if you did not witness the way you were supposed to, then these people that God had placed you in their midst, they're going to find if they die before you, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. And you know who's going to be held accountable and responsible for it? You will. Because the Bible says in Ezekiel, their blood will be upon your head. You are not here to sit in a, in a church and warm the pew on a Sunday morning, go home and forget what God had said through his word, and forget about God, and never open your mouth wherever you're at. You are here to be the voice, the hands, the heart, the compassion, the love, the mercy of God. You are here to celebrate Christ. For all the joyful things of what he's done for you, you should have an expression of joy. You should be like a hot air balloon, and you should be out there and telling them the world around you with the world that he's placed you in, letting them know of the plan of Jesus Christ that God loves you. He can shed those problems off of you right now. All you need to do is bow your heart. Bow your heart before him. Amen. Amen. And God is asking for us to open up our mouth yes. and basically proclaim Him. Thank you, Lord. How many of you know God is really high on His Son? You know that? When God sees His Son, Jesus Christ, or even hears the name, I believe He's dancing in heaven. He is high on Jesus. Amen. He's going to wave up there whenever He sees and or hears about His Son. We, on the other hand, sometimes we do the wave whenever we see a baseball game. Nowadays, football is the mainstay for most people. Nothing wrong with it. But the problem is, all we ever do is talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers, if that's your team. Kansas City Chiefs, whatever, whatever sport, whatever, whatever team you're enthused by. And the problem with all of it is, we're so fascinated by it that we, we talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers. I talk about the Kansas City Chiefs. I love them. Uh, Steelers, they went out the back door on me a long time ago. But I love the Kansas City Chiefs. I think they're a phenomenal team. But I even look up what they're doing on the offseason. They're not even playing. I want to see who they're bringing in, who they letting go, who, who are they letting go, on and on and on. But how could it be that we turn around and we can talk about our most favorite team, whatever sports fanatic you are, whatever you're into, it might not even be a sport, 
But we can talk about our favorite thing that so fascinates us on a week-to-week -week basis, but not even once a year, we can talk about Jesus Christ. And if that's the case with any of you, then I say, Houston, we have a problem. We have a problem. How can you go around and talk about all the other fascinating things regarding this world that is going to burn up and fall away? But yet, you don't talk about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And the only reason is, is because you're always going to find that people will always have it on their lips. The one thing that is fascinating to them, what they believe in, what they have confidence in, what they trust. That's what they're going to speak about. Remember, this, remember the series, Charlie's Angels? Yeah. Three beautiful women, just like the women are, that are here this morning. And these three ladies carried pistols. They were mafiosa. <laughs> and they went out, and they were the angels that they took care of, taking care of the interest of Charlie. Mm -hmm. Now, they never saw Charlie. Remember the story? Remember yeah. the series? They never saw Charlie. Charlie was invisible to them. But he wasn't invisible to us because the producer of the show let us know who Charlie was. But they never saw Charlie, but they went, and how it was, the governor, the mayor, would get a hold of Charlie in his office, say, we have an upset, we have a problem, here, there, whatever. And then Charlie would call his angels on a hot phone, they would pick up the phone, they would, they would uh, hear what's being, being said, and then they would go at whatever's necessary, they would go in the harm's way, as what they had to do, so as to benefit the interest of Charlie. And they would, before the show was over, they would, uh, they would, they, they would get the, the criminal, the crook, the perpetrator, they got him, they, they got him put in, they had him put in jail, whatever. And so they did it for the interest of Charlie. Now, what's fascinating about that, that's Charlie's angels. Now, you and I are ambassadors. Can you say yes to that? Amen. Okay? Ambassador <coughs> means a messenger. Can you say yes to that? Yes. That's what an ambassador is. <coughs> the Bible says that a messenger is an angel. Oh, well, here we go. When you go home, take a look in the, in the mirror. You are an angel yes. to the Lord. Amen. That's who you are. Yes. If you are an ambassador to the Lord, <laughs> one that's going to go and make an appeal to the world, yes. then you are heaven's angel that had yes. been born at this time to be an angel for God to go and speak for the interest of Almighty God. Even though... 1 Peter, I believe it is, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, even though you've never seen God, never seen Him, yet you love Him. Why? Because we are His ambassadors, and we represent His interest. So that's what God is asking for you and I. When you go and you, and you witness as an ambassador, it's going to be tough. Yeah. It's not going to be easy breezy. You're going to have difficulty. You're going to have people laugh and mock and ridicule. But you know what? You are there not for you. and You can take it. Amen. Because God yeah. will give you the influence that you need. If you are a lit up masterpiece. Yes. Moving forward into the darkness oh, as you should be. Yeah, thank you, but God will give you his utterance. It will flow out of you. Now let me tell you a little bit about that utterance. I put together scriptures. I've learned this over the years that I can trust God. The Bible says, I will never let my children be put to shame. He, he showed me the truth. I put the scriptures together. When I get up, I get a little nervous because I have to get synchronized with the Lord. But then he gives me stuff. And the stuff that I am given, I give to you. It's flowing out of me. It's not written down. It's flowing out of me. Because, see, that's the utterance of God. Recognize that it's not me at times that is speaking to you or any other person, I would pray, that is up here uh, giving the sermon, but it's the Holy Spirit that is already giving the unadulterated word, the influential word, the empowering word of Almighty God oh, yeah. to you, and you shouldn't be sitting there like bumps on a log. You should be writing this stuff down and taking it home and revisiting it because then God will take what you have received and He will add to it, okay? It's called progressive revelation. He will give you more because then you will have the utterance of God filled up inside of you. And as you go into the darkness, then as you open up your mouth, you don't have a thing to worry about. You're going to think, my, where did that come from? I can't believe I said that. I can't believe those scriptures came out of me. 
because that is the utterance of Almighty God. With all that said, with all that said, the reason why I gave you this sermon is I wanted to, I wanted to challenge you. I wanted to give you a simple challenge. It is a very simple challenge. It's one challenge with two sides to it. Are you willing? Are you willing to receive and accept this challenge? This is a mission. Remember the mission, uh, mission impossible. If you wish to receive and accept this mission, okay, before this this tape burns up, it's a simple mission. Mission, but there's two sides to it. The first side is, I'm going to give you 12 months. I'm going to give you 12 months to win one soul for the kingdom of God. Now that is weak. That is weak. Would you say that's weak? Yeah. You've got 12 months, 365 days to win one soul for the kingdom of God. But then side B is when you're out there and you're witnessing to people, don't get excited because you shared the gospel with them. You need to keep them with you. Yes. Because see, if they accepted Christ, then they became a new creation in Christ Jesus. And as we know, the enemy's going to come and he's going to try to infiltrate, he's going to try to steal the word, and he's going to make their life a miser miserable hell. Mm -hmm. You need to take them and you need to have them with you. That means whatever they need. They need clothing, they need, they need uh, food, whatever. You be there. And I'm speaking out of experience. I did it with uh, Brother Brian Froach. He's a little bit under the weather, but I did it with him when he was out, out of sorts. And I came, and I, I not only witnessed to him in the grocery store, but I took care of him. I went to his house. I took care of his grocery bills at times. I don't want to exaggerate that. I did it once, and I said, if you ever need it again, please ask me. But the truth of the matter is, I brought him in, and you can see that he was starting to reshape. He was starting to look good. He started to wear the right clothes. He started, And we had him preach up here. So you can see what will happen when you go and you don't leave somebody out there. You bring them under your authority. You go and you love on them. You keep them in focus, eye to eye. Attend to whatever their needs. But what you don't want to do, you don't want to go and get somebody who belongs to another church. Right, right. The reason I say that is because the second part of it is when you out, you're out there witnessing, you bring them into the fold. You bring them into the church. They need to understand the formality of the church. Hebrews 10.25 Do not forsake the assembling of thyself, that they can be edified, equipped, encouraged, uh, supported. Therefore, as they're in the church, then we collectively, as a body, we will help them. Are they decadent? Are they broken? Are they hurting? Are they in need? We will co collectively, we will take care of their needs along the way. Amen? Amen? But when we go, you have to understand, you are the heart, you are the mouth, you are the compassion, you are the love. You are Christ himself. As he is, so are we on the earth. We are as like Jesus Christ. Amen? And you're going to have rough times. I can give you a real quick uh, final note here, just so you'll have an understanding. 17 years ago, Michael was um, 18 years of age. You played baseball for Sid Bream at that time? 18 years of age. That goes back, help me here, 17 years ago? 18 years ago? Before I pastored, I was on the board of directors of CSI. Anybody watch CSI on TV? You ever watch CSI? Nobody? It wasn't that CSI. This was Christian Sports International. It was founded by a professional uh, retired baseball pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds and also a retired 13-year umpire. And I don't even remember their names. Dave, and I don't remember the other guy's name now. You? Sid Bream and Dave something. Okay. Anyhow, uh, they were they were they put this they put this organization together. What a phenomenal organization it was. And I was privileged to be on the board of directors. And what they were comprised of, they got uh, individual Christian men that were either playing the game present moment or retired, not just around here, but all over the United States. They had involved uh, uh, Nolan Ryan. Uh, I got to see Robin Cole and Jerome Bettis came into the into our office as we gathered on one Tuesday night. And what they would do, they would have an assembly of seminars that they would provide for children, uh, grade school and high school. They would have these seminars for $10 per child. 
And they would all gather. There would be, I don't know how many, but they would have it. They would already notify. It would be either baseball, football, basketball. Uh, we even had a crazy race car driver. You ever see that, those guys? And he was involved in it as well. We had all kind of people that availed themselves. And we had these seminars. And so when the seminars took place, generally it was outside in the summer months. And uh, a lot of children showed up and their parents, because they were all starstruck by the people that were showing the fundamentals of that particular sport, whether it was baseball or football or whatever. But then what they would do, they would also feed these kids. They would give them a lunch uh, of a couple sandwiches and milk, or whatever drink, you know, apples, juices, whatever. But then as they're giving the fundamentals on the sport, they broke it and kind of gleaned it into the fundamentals of Christianity. And they started to share the fundamentals of Christianity uh, along the way. Up to that point, before I left there, uh, they had some 60-some thousand children a year that were receiving Christ. Now, in the wintertime, they had these seminars going on in high schools. Now, as long as the school, it was during, during the school season, or school time, you weren't allowed to say the name of Jesus, believe it or not. But after school, if you wanted to still have a, a supporting time where you can uh, minister to the children, then you could use the name of Jesus. Well, Sid Brain, uh, he's kind of a funny guy. He was told when he went down to South Carolina on behalf of CSI, he was told, I know you like to pray over the people, and you know, I know you like to use the name of Christ, but don't do that here because you will offend many of the adult people that are here. Well, Sid, being a kind-hearted man, got up there, and the first thing out of his mouth, he said uh, so many words. I'm paraphrasing what he said. But he said, I, I want to thank you, Lord, for all these beautiful children and all the teachers and all of the council, uh, the, the, the school counselors that are here and all of the adults that are also here at this time. I want to thank you, Lord, because I know that these people, all of us, have been created by you and through you and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Right? Boom. There goes the big bong, okay? And he starts, to, he starts to shine Jesus on his conversation, went through his entire program of what he wanted to say and everything, and many children got saved. And then we got a letter on, on, on our behalf back at the office that that school never allows us to be there again. We have been denied access. And I want you to know that we laughed because we didn't care about the fact that we were not allowed to go there because of man. We were not going to allow the muffling of the Word of God to be just that, muffled and muted. And we were going to continue on. It's just kind of like Paul said. Paul said, you want to beat me up? You want to kill me? <laughs> you kill me, that's good, because I graduate. To, to, you know, uh, if you kill me, I'm with Christ. You let me live, I'm just going to continue to serve the Lord. And that's how it was with us. As wherever we went, whatever we did, and it just the, the, the work is still going on. It's still going on. I could ask those people to come here and minister, but the church is not big enough. I mean, honestly, they go in churches, if they go into a church where there's probably a couple thousand people that they have a nice audience of people that could have a monthly giving to them. And if you ever want them here, I can pick up the phone, I can bring them here, and uh, you know, no problem. I'd like to get maybe one of the, the superstars to come in here. We'd have, we'd have to put people, chairs on the outside because of the, uh, the celebrity that we're bringing in. But I say this, when you go out, be the ambassador that God wants you to be. He put you on, the, he put you on this earth it's exactly in the location where he has you. He wants you to be his mouthpiece. He wants you to proclaim his name. Because it's up to you now. You have already been, you have already been endorsed with his utterance. Thank you, dear. But you have to open up your mouth for that utter, utterance to come forth. But if you don't open up your mouth, in actuality, what you're saying to all those people in, the, in the, the neighborhood, in the workplace, in society, wherever it is that God is trying to get you to go to somebody that's hurting and broken, whatever, and you don't open up your mouth, what you're actually saying without saying it is, go to hell. Think about that. You're saying to those people, go to hell. Because you know what, had, what God has provided for you to save you. How dare you to hold back and not share it with others that need to hear the truth. And I don't believe that any of us want to really openly say, go to hell to anybody. We want to let them know. So I'm giving you a year. My goodness, you can't win one soul. And don't leave them out there. Bring them into the house. Encourage them that they will find their place. Because little do you know, 
as like Paul's aunt that ministered and witnessed to him. Little did she know that she was actually witnessing to what God had already pre-planned. And the plans were pre-ordained before time began by God the Father that Paul would walk in them, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. All the plans that God has written down on that tabloid of that poem. The Father, we have been created in Christ Jesus according to the plans that God had had provided in advance that we are to walk in them. So everything is already exactly displayed on, on a blueprint. You just walk through life and your poem is being unfolded and the purpose of your life is being shown and then all you have to do is open up your mouth and do it. Amen. Just do it. When you're out there and you're witnessing, Hallelujah. bring them into the house. One person in 12 months. You can't do that. There's something wrong with you. Okay? And then we'll have you checked out. But otherwise, I pray that this message blessed you. I want you to stand with me. I pray that this message blessed you, challenged you, gave you something to think about. Michael, I want you to come up and play. Uh, <coughs> don't have the privilege.